Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jose Diaz, Chief Curator of the Andy Warhol Museum. Thank you for joining us for Fantasy America Artists in Conversation. This program is inspired by the exhibition Fantasy America, which invites New York-based artists Nona Faustin, Kambui Olajime, Pacifico Solano, Nama Sabar, and Chloe Weiss to revisit Andy Warhol's 1985 publication, America, and, contrib and contribute through their own artistic practices. Over 30 years after Warhol's book and his death, the exhibition Fantasy America echoes the current moment of popular culture, political upheaval, and social reckoning. The works in this exhibition probe and challenge the perceptions of what America is and what it can become. Like Warhol, the artists in this exhibition hold a mirror to society, reflecting the country at a critical juncture in history. Each produces works that blurs the boundaries between form and material, offering a complex picture of contemporary American life. The exhibition closes on August 30th and also includes a catalog with contributions from Jessica Lene Moore and Alain Palaez. This is what the book looks like. Be sure to catch their Fantasy America Authors in Conversation program on our website and our Warhol uh, Museum YouTube channel. All right, uh, well, let's get started. Hello, everyone. Hi. Hey, Hi. How you doing? Hi. Hi, thanks for joining us. Um, well, I'm going to ask a series of questions, and I'll, uh, I'll open up some questions to the whole group, and then I'll, um, I'll ask some of you specific questions. And so the first question I'm going to ask is for all of you, and then I'm going to actually um, share my screen and just do a little bit of a slideshow. You don't need to, um, def you don't need to um, pause for the slides. I just want to give a sense of our uh, viewers at home who have may maybe perhaps have not seen the show can get a sense of what the uh, exhibition looks like. And so um, I'll start off with the first question. Um, a big part of uh, a big part of the book America. So this is Andy Warhol's uh, last publication. He would pass away in 1987, and his book America came out in 1985. Um, it's sort of a picture book. It covers life in America. It covers uh, uh, photographs from a 10-year span of uh, Warhol's uh, photography, and also from contributions from uh, friends and assistants. And so a big part of the book America. Um, in fact, a whole chapter, which is called National Geographic, represents the United States from coast to coast. Um, and I find it interesting how uh, New York City is the most celebrated city for Andy Warhol. You know, he left Pittsburgh after college uh, to establish himself as, a, as an artist, um, first as a commercial illustrator in the 1950s, and then, and then as a serious uh, pop artist, um, but eventually a multidisciplinary artist like yourselves. Um, so I wanted to ask all of you, um, can you tell me, uh, tell me a little bit about growing up, you know, like Warhol's first quote in the book, which is about imagining a fantasy America, imagining what the world's like outside of your own home. And just tell us how New York became the location for your artistic production and, and, and why you're there today. Um, can we start with you, Nona? Yeah, um, well, it, it's easy for me. I was born here. Same here. <laughs> I was born in, in Brooklyn and uh, the city was always a, a source of fascination. I lived in Crown Heights and my mom was a telephone op operator. So she was um, for what was called Ma Bell <laughs> and then the uh, AT&T and then Verizon. Um, uh oh, and oh, you changed the screen. You can keep talking. And, oh, no, so, keep talking. <laughs> and so um, she always used to take us around the city. You know, we'd go to plays and concerts and, you know, restaurants. And so she really oriented us to the city and that this was our city. You know, a lot of people feel, you know, when they come from like a predominantly black or brown neighborhoods, when they come into Manhattan, you know, it's, it's, it used to be, it used to be kind of foreign once you leave the neighborhood, you know? And so, but I never felt that way. I always felt like, you know, I knew, I learned the city. I knew the city. I felt comfortable here, but I was always asking questions about what was here and what was there and, and things like that. And so um, for me, it was, it was, it was just um, natural. Okay, great. Uh, Nama, do you want to go next, please? Sure. Um, so I grew up in the suburbs of Tel Aviv in Israel. Um, and I remember just growing up 
always having a sort of a, a fantasy about um, what's happening somewhere else, you know, um, since I grew in, in, in a place that was a bit sleepy and a bit more calm. And later in life, I moved on to Tel Aviv and, and had a, started my adulthood there, um, but still had these kind of like feelings and fantasies, kind of like something is happening somewhere else. Like, it's, it's a sort of like you're always, it's a FOMO, I guess, but you don't know what it's for. You know, it's kind of like something is happening and taking form. Um, and I'm looking for that place. And I feel like when I moved to New York, um, that feeling stopped. I just didn't feel it anymore. I felt like I'm in a place where I am, I am where things are happening, but at the same time, weirdly like having that saturation of things happening all at once in New York um I just wanted to stay home and not be where things are happening so it, it's a kind of a, of a pla weird place of comfort from a place of knowing that everything is happening around you all the time thank you uh can we thank you thank you um, yeah, I, I was born and raised in Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn, and my parents, to, they helped start a, a cultural institution called the East and, um, and Bed-Stuy, and so I was always around the arts. And what was interesting to me is as I got older, I was encountering a fantasy of what my life should be that no one asked me about or no one asked the people that I live about when they constructed that fantasy. Um, <clears throat> It was like culturally rich, it was really caring. And I would see all these depictions of New York and I was really surprised. I was almost like, what is that? That fantasy of, of a city that I wasn't experiencing. Um, and as I came to know more and more of the city, it, to me, it grew in dimension. And I realized that the more I traveled, I would always hear that like, there was a place that was supposed to operate in a certain way and then when you get there, you don't have an experience like that. And so I quickly realized that with the description of, uh, of geography, the description of community is rarely ever accurate. And I wonder, could it be accurate? Because the experience would be so much more lush, so much more complex. And so um, it was kind of good. It, it meant that I could operate in a, in a kind of every place was, uh, was taken with, every description was taken with a grain of salt and all of the fantasy New Yorks, the fantasy New Orleans or Germany's or any place that I went, there was always a fantasy that would then be um, in conversation with my experience, you know? And even just like working in film, you would see all of the, you, you know, I was a film buff, so I would see all of the depictions of New York and I would help working in film to create some of these depictions. But I would always, I would also go to those places when the lights were out and it was totally calm or totally different. Um, and so it just became, um, I don't know, it was almost like uh, all, every, every word was taken with a grain of salt and completely fluid and malleable. Thank you. Um, Chloe? Um, I grew up in Montreal, Canada. Um, my mom is from Detroit, so I am a dual citizen, but growing up in Montreal, um, which is bilingual because of Quebec, there's all of these um, restrictions in a sense. Canada is more social democratic, so it has a lot of these like, which I now understand to be amazing qualities, having socialist structures in place. Um, but my mom being American and also just the culture being very American um, facing, um, all of the, the center of all of the cultural excitement, all of the art history that, and all of the, whether it's music, plays, or all of the cultural excitement seemed to resonate um, and emanate from New York. And so it always was sort of billed to me as this freer place, as opposed to the, you know, the restrictions of Canada, which once again, I now respect a lot. <laughs> um, but New York, as a crux of the American ideal or this American myth, seemed a, this magnetic place. And so when I ended up moving to New York as a young artist, I moved when I was around 23, 
all of the things that seemed that um, previously to be out of reach or something that you had to work for and maybe deserve in some sense elsewhere seemed to be something that if you, with this American ideal of pick yourself up by your bootstraps, if you just show up, if you just do the work, that promise in one sense felt real because New York has this almost ahistorical, I guess America has an amnesiac sense where it doesn't really care about its roots or your roots or your background or your cultural upbringing. If you show up and you allegedly show up and, and consider yourself American and do the thing, you're accepted as, as such. Now that's obviously a flawed and not necessarily accurate depiction, but that myth and that, and that ideal really for a young person coming into maturity and stepping into that space felt like an endless possibility. And um, all of the people and artists that I met and came to see um, seemed, to be, seemed to be accepted for who they are, how they wanted to self-identify, how they wanted to express themselves. And um, by virtue of that, I felt that same acceptance and that same freedom um, at, at a young age. Um, and that promise, flawed as it may be, the, the component of it that is this ultimate freedom, this ultimate invitation, um, it, it it felt like the only option. It felt so, it, it still does feel so much like home, complexities and all. Thank you. And Pacifico? Hey. Yeah, so um, I'm actually, I'm born in Brooklyn and uh, I was raised sort of in the tri-state area and moved upstate at a young age. Um, but even then I, I kind of knew I, I needed to get back to New York City. I needed to get back to Brooklyn. Um, I've realized pretty early on that I was different and that I was, you know, as a queer person, like living upstate or living in Pennsylvania where, you know, I, I did high school and my, my undergrad, um, I knew that I needed to get back to like New York and a, a place where, you know, I felt like LGBTQ community was really sort of pronounced and you can be yourself. And there was sort of that, there's sort of whole history, I think, of like, young queer people leaving their small towns to go to the big city and to sort of find that freedom like Chloe was talking about and really try to make a life for yourself. And so I think that fantasy was definitely sold to me. And I knew that I wanted to be back where I belong and where I'm from. And, you know, my parents were from Brooklyn and my grandparents and, you know, um, so it's a really sort of like a deep, like, you know, family roots here. And so I came back in 2008 shortly after um, undergrad and you know I, I, I left uh, Lancaster Pennsylvania where I did my undergrad where it was a strong Amish community um, horse and buggies and uh, not gay at all <laughs> um, you know the only gay bar was called Tally Ho so um, that kind of gives you an idea of like what it was like to be a sort of a queer person there um, so I came back and I also knew that it was kind of like a creative capital of the world of where so many people come to sort of, you know, give it their all and try and be an artist. And so, you know, having, having that um, history of, you know, being born here and feeling like I needed to be here, it's only natural that I would wind back up here. And it really does feel like home. And I, I, you know, sometimes have fantasies about like moving mm -hmm. to California and like loving the West Coast and the sunlight and the beach and all that. And then I think about like how it's going to fall into the ocean and, you know, all those sort of natural disasters that California contends with. So um, I'm, in, I'm a native New Yorker at heart. And so that's, that's why I'm here. Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll open up the, uh, the, the, the rooms, the Zoom room so we can see each other's faces. Um, thank you all. Um, you know, I met all of you in different stages of my own life. I, I'm in um, I'm in Pittsburgh right now, uh, Andy Warhol's hometown, and that's where the Andy Warhol Museum is located. Um, but he identified as a New Yorker. He spent a majority of his life there, and um, and then he returned upon death, so he's buried here in Pittsburgh. Um, but working with all of you, I'm so thankful to have had the opportunity. And the show is uh, obviously still up until August 30th, and. Um, Working on this exhibition, you know, I was inspired by uh, Warhol's, you know, Warhol's book America, which is this one. But we made we made a new catalog, and the catalog has new text. It's it's it was important for me to 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 look at artists, uh, the legacy of Warhol, artists that are practicing today. This show was not meant to be responsive to what was happening. Your practices were always responsive around your own lived experiences, 
And one thing I found fascinating, this is a question I have for a couple of you, um, the, the, the exhibition for those um, that are viewing at home, it actually was postponed on many occasions. So prior to COVID, if you recall, I had kept pushing the show, dates were changing. And um, with that, you know, I had, I had a studio visits with you. I've, had, I've talked to all of you on the phone um, and the checklist has changed. And even in the, in the, in the final hour, we had added, you know, change swap works in the show. Um, so I, I wanted to, you know, just ask a couple of you, cause there's some works that stuck out to me that were new additions to the show. They were, they were made, you know, uh, I want to go to you, uh, Kambui, you, you have been, uh, yeah, you, I've known you the longest in this, in this zoom room. I think you and Nama, but you were so, um, active on social media and you're involved in a lot of um, social, social justice groups and you were illustrating nonstop on, on social media, on Instagram, et cetera. And you've been working on an ongoing project, North Star, and you actually made two, you know, two ginormous illustrations, uh, paintings for this show, which actually is part of a larger project. So can you talk about that project, North Star, and, and why you wanted to include these in the exhibition? Oh, I think you're on mute. And I said all my, all my great things in that little- Oh, no. <laughs> um, um, North Star is a project that really looks to recontextualize what Blackness is within contemporary art, especially in, in, within Western art history. But it, it looks at what is the Black body in zero gravity outside of a kind of assumed uh, gravity of white supremacy and oppression. And so I think when we talk about the sort of fantastic spaces of American, you know, idealism or even just like nation or like any of the things that pop up when you construct a, a, a country, but specifically this country, um, it's important to engage both in policy and like you said, like policy and like kind of the kind of hard spaces of everyday living as well as the mythic. And so for me, I wasn't seeing a lot of these images. And so I wanted to create um, I wanted to create that space. Um, and so what I'm, the project is a, is a multi-year project. These large paintings that are all watercolor and ink, um, I thought would fit so well in terms of how America could be put, you know, pictured. Um, later in the year, I'm planning to take a group of people from the African diaspora and to, you like this part. <laughs> you know? I do because it's 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 so incredible and it's it's almost like something out of a, a well a science fiction. We're gonna do some parabola flights where we go to like fifty thousand feet in free fall and um, experience weightlessness, and um, that's gonna be part of a, a film component to the project. Um, but I just think in in terms of um, the other work that I have in, in the show, as well as the work that you have curated in the show, that all in conversation with Warhol's um, initial offering seems so um, spot on, you know, to, to mm -hmm. interrogate and, and to create new imagined spaces. Thank you. Yeah, and an another new work that um, I was not anticipating, Chloe, you had made a new piece uh, we included in the show last minute. I did want to emphasize your, your, your film and video work um, in, in, well, in general, because I was so familiar with your sculpture and painting, but you ended up making a new work, uh, Alternative Facts. And for, for those of us who have not seen the exhibition yet, can you just describe it quickly and, wh and why you made that piece? Because it's, 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 it's similar, but also different than what you would have made for film and video. Yeah, absolutely. So um, to describe the work, it's um, a video of um, a beach at sunset with um, an 80s um, TV screen that I rescued from the dump in Long Island. <laughs> it was really hard to get to the beach. It was quite heavy. <laughs> and I um, superimposed a video of myself reciting the, well, a one-sided monologue of Kellyanne Conway in 2017, early 2017. Um, one of her, I think, more iconic and infamous, very upsetting <laughs> um, interactions with the press where she was telling Chuck Todd that um, the Trump inauguration was the biggest ever and don't believe your eyes and don't believe your own experience. There are alternative facts. And that, um, that back and forth, while it's humorous because it's you know, ridiculous and hindsight is 2020, 2021, but that happened, that was one of the initial moments, one of the first instances of what would go on to be the most gaslighting we have all <laughs> experienced 
I'm actually not the most gaslighting, obviously. I'm not going to try to speak about American history. It is one large gaslight, of course, in terms of the way that authority speaks to constituents. But Kellyanne Conway describing um, something that was clearly not the same size as Obama's um, inauguration. What a petty and unimportant, but factually provably wrong um, um, statistic to, 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 to latch onto, like what a hill to die on, you know? And, and that was January, 2017, I mean, perfect foreshadowing. I think a great example of what we would go on to experience. And this also, I made this video before the election and before the insurrection, um, and we are still continuing. And I think we will continue to experience such a large scale erasure and revisionist history of things that we're currently living through, telling you that you're not seeing what you're seeing empirically. Um, and it's, I think an example and an allegory for um, um, what happens when democracy is a fragile um, structure worth preserving, but can fall and topple into tyranny so easily. And one of the one of the first instances or examples of that that shift beginning to take place is the destabilization of an, a truth that we can all agree on. Democracy exists based on a shared experience of not absolute truth, but at least shared facts. And when the news media is being um, demonized and um, experience is being questioned, it's a very dangerous uh, space. And, um, but in terms of the visuals of the video, that there's a TV sitting on a beach at sunset where it's me speaking this monologue of Kellyanne Conway um, to no one in particular, just as though this TV washed up ashore as a relic of a time, potentially this is post-apocalypse, maybe 2022. Mm -hmm. um, at the time, it was also feeling very scary, you know, in the summer before the election, there was a lot of fear and uncertainty. And so I imagined this um, world after humanity where TVs wash up ashore and continue to indifferently deliver their message to who, uh, of lies to whoever is or isn't listening. But then at the end of the video, I am watching the video of myself. And so there's this, um, I think that's also important in any kind of um, political commentary or satire or parody to also be self reflexive in terms of one's own complacency or participation in the mm -hmm. structure that one is critiquing. And so in a sense, as a consumer of news media and as a person who in my own right, I'm also opining my own um, political views based on things I can't empirically prove either. It's sort of like I'm critiquing the way that she's and the Trump administration and the Republican party and America at large um, gaslights us, but um, absolute truth may not exist. And so we're all part of this difficult um, negotiation of truth and whose experience is absolutely verifiable and post-apocalyptic news media yeah. sunset moments. <laughs> yeah, no, I, no I, I appreciate that piece. And that takes me to no Nona, your, your, your addition to your My Country series. It's, it's unlike any of the other ones. It still has that that red blur, that red vibrancy. Um, but this is also something you would and be, and, and even literally to the TV set, you were at home. And do you want to talk about the new piece that you had added into your portfolio? Yeah. So um, the new piece is called, Oh No, The Devil Never Ever Lies. And it's a picture of Trump in front of the church after he gassed a bunch of peaceful protesters. Um, and I happened to be home recovering from COVID and I was talking to a friend and she said, have you done any new work? And I was like, no, I haven't done any new work. I've been, you know, <laughs> you know, I've basically been sick, you know, it had been, I was still, like I said, recovering. And then uh, I was watching CNN and uh, he came on TV and they just, they showed it. And as they were showing it, I just couldn't believe it. And so I grabbed my camera, which was nearby. And um, I had, you know, uh, I just I just took a picture of the screen. It was perfect because, you know, CNN had that America up there. So they like did pretty much all the work for me, basically. Mm -hmm. And I did, and then, you know, his hair looks like almost like a, um, a, a, 
a spaceship, you know, that <laughs> it looks like, you know, like it's it, so it's, it was quite stunning. And um, I, I, I knew it had to be in the show, but also it was something that I felt Andy, Andy himself would have done. Like, I, I know he would have grabbed that moment. And, you know, there was so many moments in his presidency, but I think that was the one that really stood out, you know, for the aud sheer audacity, the, sh the show, the spectacle of it all, you know. And um, then he's holding the upside down Bible in his hand, you know. He didn't even... It, which proved to me, you know, how much, how little he cared about what he was doing. Um, it was all, you know, so that's how that came about. Thank you. Yeah. And I was really, I was really uh, proud to show it and include it in the exhibition. So thank you. And one thing I, one thing I really connected with all of your work uh, in the show is this um, sense of community, varied communities, different communities. Um, and so I want to go to you Pacifico, uh, your work, um, it's very intimate and personal, and it's from your series After Silence, which um, it specifically addresses the, the AIDS pandemic. However, I feel the work now takes on a whole new meaning. This exhibition was planned prior to COVID-19. It's changed our lives. It's the reason we're all on Zoom and not in-person gathering. Um, so can you just talk about your work and sort of uh, the origins of it, but specifically what it means today, especially going through another, uh, another uh, pandemic? Sure. Yeah, um, you know, I was born at the height of the AIDS crisis. And uh, my uncle, he was a gay man, and uh, he passed away from complications of HIV when I was like three years old. And uh, after he died, he was, he was, you know, Brooklyn Italian family kind of erased from the legacy and the family album. And so I grew up with no pictures of him. And um, so I wanted to have this sort of, you know, this project that kind of explored that um, years ago when I was in graduate school and, you know, not having a photograph to rely on or a family photo album to appropriate. Uh, I, I started to think about media representations. And so um, I started to rework, you know, vintage gay erotica, these sort of publications of these widely distributed, cheaply produced uh, magazines. And coincidentally, my, um, my parents, they actually ran an adult novelty store when I was a teenager and in my college years. So I have this very you know, sort of unique, interesting relationship to pornography and the source material with which I work with. And so I'm always sort of looking for these really quiet, tender moments within the pages of these centerfolds, um, trying to find like these, like really hone in on these like really, you know, specific details of just like, what is it like for the area around the model, like as witness, like, you know, bearing witness to sort of all this immense loss as a result of, you know, the AIDS crisis, which was really poorly handled by the US government, you know, particularly the Reagan administration, you know, who really saw that some of the most vulnerable people were, you know, suffering from HIV and, you know, AIDS complications and kind of let them languish for many, many years um, until it was out of control. And so, you know, a pandemic like, you know, HIV and AIDS, and then COVID-19, and you see again, a coincidentally Republican, um, you know, administration that lets its most vulnerable people, you know, get sick and die and kind of have a sort of callous indifference uh, to the suffering of others. Um, I think it's impossible not to sort of make the relationship between the two. But I also realize, you know, they're very different, very different pandemics and, you know, very different circumstances. But there is still a sort of relationship between the two. You know, I think we've just gone through a period of immense loss and mourning. And I think there is a lot of trauma that we've experienced as a country and as a world. Um, and I don't think it's, you know, completely unlike, you know, the loss, uh, you know, of the late, you know, the 1980s and 90s of people who were dying, you know, every other week, you know, people were burying friends and family. The difference, I think, though, um, is that at least there was that human connection and that uh, way of being able to be with somebody and I think the real cruelty of what we've been experiencing is just the, the lack of, of intimacy, the lack of being able to comfort our loved ones when somebody's passed away. Um, and so those are ideas that, you know, I've been ruminating on a lot in the past year while I've been making the work. Um, but, uh, you know, so much of what I do is about memorial and is about 
sort of carrying on a legacy. And, uh, you know, the work has changed and it's grown since, you know, our initial um, studio visit in what, 2016, 2017. Um, but I do believe that it's taken on a different significance in the past year. Yeah, and that takes me to uh, an extension of that, and that's really um, intimacy. And this is something um, that is, is relates in a lot of your work. Like Chloe, you have lots of gr groupings in your work. Um, but I want to ask you, Nama, and then uh, I want to ask you, uh, Kambui, um, in in your film Stranger, you know, it's basically yourself intimately playing a double this double sided guitar um, with a companion. There's a lot of tension and negoti physical negotiating, but also this like sexual. It has a lot of sexual sexuality into it too, or sexual, um, uh, yeah, sexuality, it's very sexual. Um, but then also in Blind Sum, Akumbu, you did a whole photo series about dance-a-thons. These, uh, these happened uh, after the Great, or during the Great Depression. These were um, moments of endurance, but also survival. And you recreated a, a whole photo series, um, but with black couples because uh, you were doing historical research. And a lot of your work actually relates around um, historical events. And so, um, yeah, so Nama, do you want to just tell me a little about, about Stranger? And, and one thing I talked to you about also when you visited the Warhol, you know, Andy Warhol loved the nightlife. It was a place of liberation. You, you actually got your early starts as like, I think as a musician, as a bartender, and a lot of your work actually uses the, the materials from that. I, I actually love some of your works, which we did not include. You do a whole sculpture series of bed sheets and liquor bottles. And, you know, that to me, that's like, uh, that that really uh, exemplifies like uh, yeah the liberation the freedom of the night and of course Warhol was very much a uh, very much a creature of the night but yeah this is uh, this notion of intimacy and it's something we don't have now obviously because of COVID nineteen and obviously trying to to survive in a new way um, so yeah Nama do you want to um, just ex expand on that sure I guess I'll I'll you know talk a bit about stranger and you know intimacy there. Um... You know, as a side note, I think, you know, you're referring to my my work, Sweat, where, where I do marry, like, Sweat, you know, yeah. minimal, minimal, like, looking shelves with bed sheets and liquor bottles, and they kind of exhaust their own selves. And I think, you know, it has, like, that potential of um, being inflamed and kind of going up and, you know, a Molotov bottle or, like, a cocktail or, like, uh, something to consume, um, but there's kind of like systems that fail themselves and kind of like, kind of like the nightlife, you know, it's, it's, there's, it's, it's a capsule of time that, that kind of like um, has a, a time framed experience that, that only can exist within that capsule of time. You know, when I was a bartender for many years, um, I would see some of my clients during the day and I wouldn't recognize them because they were just like, something out of the night you know um so i think there's something about that time that's very alluring but also very specific to its own existence with stranger you know i was thinking about so i do have a background with um with instruments um specifically the electric guitar and i played in a band as you mentioned and and um i was thinking about this um, instrument as a, as a sort of like, you know, throughout the history of rock and roll, kind of like this instrument of the soulless player, you know, and specifically in the hands usually of uh, gendered, it's a gendered instrument, usually in the hand of men. Um, and I was thinking about what happens, you know, and, and it's, you know, you hold it and it's like this, this image, this like phallic image, you know, of like an extension. And what happens if you double that? Um, phallic, you know, component within that object, and it becomes a sort of like almost like a handicap that kind of like resists being occupied or like manipulated by one person, but rather needs a co collaboration. And so, with Stranger, um, is the work that started off as a as a live performance that kind of like through the years became a video work, um, and it's it's about I call it a relationship piece. It's completely intimate and it's like this object that is imposing this hyper intimate relationship between these two musicians. Um, specifically, you know, they're always, when we perform as well, it's always um, women. Um, mm -hmm. For me, that is, you know, something that relates to my own sexuality and my own um, kind of um, places that I want to explore. But I think also kind of putting this object that's been rendered different from its historic origin and into the hands of women rather than again into the hands of two men. Um, there is some sort of like a dance there between, between um, 
you know, between control and letting go of control and between movements and, and it's a complete, you know, it is a relationship, like any good relationship. There is mm -hmm. like these moments where you dance together and then there's moments when you're pulling your partner to one end um, and trying to negotiate space and movement. Um, and for me, you know, it's, it's for, when I thought of, of this work, I was, I was very, very uh, attracted to the idea of like also displaying something that is very intimate and almost like for the viewers become almost voyeurism of seeing something happen between these two women um, that is very, um, has sexual tones um, and sensual. And, you know, I, I think that's an interesting place, you know, for the viewer as well to kind of negotiate their place um, in relationship mm -hmm. to, to the, to, you know, to, to this thing that's happening in front of them, to a relationship unfolding. Um, but yeah, for me, you know, the, the, the guitar, which is called uh, Untitled Double Face, that, that's from Stranger, from the video, is a sort of like um, a vessel to, for, for two bodies to come together, you know, and negotiate, which, um, you know, is, is something that we all have to do all the time. And I think countries as well, um, we're all negotiating, you know, we have this land and we're negotiating it, you know, I come from Israel, unfortunately, right now, there's big negotiations going on there. Um, so it's, it's, um, it's something that's very close to just my experience of, of being. Thank you. Yeah, and actually, you, you identified a, a painting in, the, in, in our collection, the dance diagrams, which Warhol painted, they're appropriated dance steps and they were actually exhibited on the floor when they were first uh debuted which were performative in nature and of course you're a performance yeah. artist as well and kambui your uh, blind sun series uh, you were also your eyes lit up and we looked at those as well uh, do you want to just talk about blind sun yeah i mean i love that piece nama i also thank you i like that piece because it just to me at least like my my read on it has always been like creation is collaborative like there's this notion that they keep trying to sell us where it's like artists is off on the hill by themselves and they have this singular moment of inspiration and no, nobody else is involved in that. Nobody else is just us. And it's like, right. I, I love that piece because it's like, no, this is what it, this is what creation is. Totally. Um, Thank um, you. And I also, speaking of creation, I mean, collaboration, that when you pulled that piece, I saw that, um, and uh, Jose was telling me about it. I love this. I, this Jose was saying there's a couple of them um, circulating in the world. And I'd seen another one. I was like, yeah. And I was so happy that it was able to be next to the dance marathon because, you know, there were these um, contests that started out as youth culture. And it became this, um, again, a kind of dual space of, of the grotesque and the mythic where people would dance from sun, you know, 24 hours, seven days a week. And it was not really dance, it was more like perpetual motion. motion. And they would do it um, for like five or six months at a time. And so um, they were whites only. Um, and thinking about why this, you know, doesn't exist in a black contest, I sort of came up to this um, conclusion of a, a very different relationship within, a, between dance and um, the African diaspora, as well as being black in America in that time, and arguably even now, is an endurance test. So there's no space for, or no need for that construction. Mm -hmm. But what was interesting to me was the everyday endurance tests that were happening that were going unmemorialized or unnoticed or, un, you know. And so that's what blind some, um, was really looking to explore. And it was part of a, a multi, like a seven, eight, and still question mark uh, <laughs> when I'm gonna close it out, uh, body of work. And when Jose first uh, talked to me about being included in the show, I wanted to build these, um, remember those sculptures that were like platforms and I was- That's right, I, to I totally forgot. We were gonna build your dance platforms. That's right, go ahead. Yeah, and then there's performance and you know, and so these are sculptures that 
explore those ideas of identity and um, endurance and persistence and what that means. And, and so that space was then occupied by the photographs. Um, but all of these things are at play. It, it's a kind of, it's a piece of American performance history that gets swept under the rug. It informs like everything from like soap operas, to roller derbies to like reality TV with like all of there's vaudeville, you know? Um, and so I was really interested in having that kind of space when we talk about the performativity of this American identity um, and, and also its gaps. So it's kind of a testament to a vacancy. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, yeah, I forgot about those dance platforms. We worked a long time to actually customize those. People were gonna be basically be able to use them. We were gonna have people perform on them. Um, and I think we just lost Nama. I don't know if that's a performance piece, but um, hopefully she comes back. Um, I wanna jump to you, Chloe, since we're talking also about Warhol. For some reason, you are, when people visit, you're, you are considered the most Warholian of all artists, um, which is kind of funny because I think, you know, but it's interesting because I, again, I, I think of Warhol as multidisciplinary, but when people see your work, I know you're influenced by like 17th century Dutch uh, paintings. You know, this is the age of exploration. Um, but that, and you're also interested in like 20, 20 century marketing strategies. I know uh, uh, Roland Barthes writing about like um, soap sud ads, which is something that was really fascinating because a lot of people thought your Purell and your gloves was a response to COVID, which is not the case. Um, but then you also take from like existing media, like brochures, menus, commercials, advertising, infomercials. And so I'm, I'm curious just as in terms of popular culture, oh, and I think Nama's back. Uh, in terms of popular culture, um, you know, the calm and the chaos, how do you edit and refine that to actually make a painting, a film or a, a body of work? Because it's a lot out there. <laughs> There's a lot out there. Um, I've always been really inspired by Warhol since I was very young, one of the first artists that really spiked my interest. And I think it was also his relationship to the Velvet Underground and how and fashion and, and celebrity and how far reaching it was. And I think there's something very human about artists like Warhol utilizing um, and pinpointing desire and certain parts of um, individual desire for um, um, aspirational acceptance or um, affluence or opulence and luxury, which brings um, the Dutch still life, Dutch golden age kind of painting into the conversation as well, because those paintings of, of opulent, luxurious still lives with oysters and lobsters and steak, they were testaments to look at all my stuff. I am part, I am represented by the fleeting yet abundant bounty of a harvest that I could afford to have. So I am worthy, yet we will die. Like the memento mori and the- and Memento the, mori, yeah, the vanitas, yeah. Exactly, um, of Dutch still life and in such an opulent age, I think is very um, um, much in line with the way um, Warhol speaks of more mundane consumer goods, like all of the like Brillo pads or any like cans, all of those things as mundane and everyday as they are, speak to the convenience, accessibility, and um, the um, aspiration of, a, of being an American and consumer. And so I think um, throughout art history, throughout history in general, to the present day, um, um, capitalist and consumer society um, invites in, or in, uh, infers the desire on individuals to um, create a sense of self and worth based on the objects they choose to consume with their dollar. And I think it's very interesting when um, we look at advertising and how, how every one of us is bombarded by thousands of images that are advertising, that are stra strategically choosing to use fonts or language or imagery that will target a desire that you have for something fundamental, whether it is um, community, um, luxury, comfort, um, family, sexual desirability, um, um, assimilation, all of these, or like American ideals, all of these desires are very strategically almost like like per perfectly operated on by advertising and so utilizing those strategies within art i think feels um in the back of our mind almost like natural like we can we can comfortably look at imagery that utilizes 
beauty and the glimmer of a diamond ring or the shine of a, of a tomato with a little droplet of water as it cascades down its perfect curve, implying freshness, like all of those, all of that imagery and language um, is really recognizable to us because we are constantly bombarded with it in America. And so I use, I kind of utilize th those ideas of beauty and desirability um, in painting and sculpture and also in video the video work Offer Ending Soon, which is one of my earliest video works, which I'm so excited is in the show. Um, the, the language and the, the intonation and the, the change of the music and the wording is, um, is very reminiscent of an infomercial or a commercial. And the, the idea that you don't even know what's being advertised to you. You mentioned menus. Um, the script of that film, so to speak, is the Cheesecake Factory menu that I like stole from a Cheesecake Factory in Yonkers. And I was like, okay, I'm directing. And the line is oven roasted turkey breast garnished with basil. It's like the idea that someone's sexualizing a menu is not so far off from the way that we are actually sold food, like oozing cheese. Or I'm also using a Scientology <laughs> like webs like brochure. Uh, and a lot of language that is super recognizable, like call now for a discount or free trial. These, all of this language and all of these fragments of um, what it is to be American, which is to be bombarded by things that like the cruel optimism of what you should desire and what you should aspire to and how you should put your time towards acquiring and consuming. All of that language I think is made uncanny by placing it within the context of an artwork or a video piece where it is destabilized from its ultimate goal of selling you something. Um, but at the same time, art is not so divorced from the act of selling something. So those things are quite interrelated. But I think Warhol did a very interesting um, or, or engaged in a more, inter in a more um, um, overt manner than any other artist with these ideas of, of consumerism as it is completely interconnected and inextricable from um, individual experience as a person, as an artist, as, as a body. Um, and I would love, I love to be <laughs> compared yeah. because I aim to do a similar explanation. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And actually two of, two of you actually in incorporated Warhol into your installations. Um, Nona, um, aside from commodities, you know, America's full of symbols and, you know, for symbols, you've actually targeted, you know, civic buildings, monuments, even looking at your, your series, My Country, which is our country. Um, so even your photos, and, and by the way, you made silk screens for this show, which they, they, they glow, they're vibrant. Um, but some of those monuments you documented, they're no longer even on site, like the Marion Sims and the, the Teddy Roosevelt. Um, but you paired it with a Warhol wallpaper. He depicted the Washington Monument on that wallpaper. Warhol also depicted the Statue of Liberty throughout his whole life. His parents came in through Ellis Island. Um, but anyways, I know when we had talked early, that was something we had paired. So I just want to talk a little about that and maybe the influence of, of why you chose that, of Warhol and why you chose that to go with this particular portfolio. Well, um, you know, once you, once you um, uh, approached me about the idea of using the wallpaper, I just thought, you know, it was perfect because one, you know, I've, I've always, like I told you, been a fan of Andy since, you know, a little kid. Um, you know, growing up, he was like everywhere, you know, the, at that point he was everywhere. He's like, I think it was towards the end of his life, the, the, the ketchup commercial, the Burger King commercials and things like that. And so, yeah, you know, um, he was like this rock star, but, and so I felt like also one of the reasons why I wanted to do silk screens was because of him. And I, I, in shooting my country from the moment that I conceived of them, I thought of them as silk screens, you know, and I, I didn't have the means to do it. Like I, I wanted to do it until, you know, I met two palms and David Lazary and Evelyn and they, you know, um, have this huge facility and workshop where we could do it. And, um, I just felt like the work, you know, is um, in looking at these monuments is looking at, you know, um, memory, but trauma within all these monuments um, and moments uh, is, is, is the American trauma. Um, if you look at um, the Link Lincoln Memorial, 
uh, for me, that is a monument of, of trauma. You know, one, it's talking about, you know, Lincoln, who was assassinated, you know, but also, you know, I think of in, con in conflict, well, in connection with the Civil War and the biggest trauma that our country ever experienced, um, I would say, outside of 9-11 you know, um, that moment. And then Washington, even Washington's memorial, I, I think of it as one of trauma because, you know, um, again, the Revolutionary War. And I was reading, you know, a lot of uh, books, you know, about the beginning of our country and these incredible moments and, you know, who took part, who helped, you know, in the Revolutionary War, enslaved men and, and men, fought in the place of their masters and and Washington rode into battle with you know enslaved men his 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 serv what he calls servant but it was enslaved man um and so like all of these even the Statue of Liberty the Statue of Liberty you know um to me com you know it commemorates the ending of slavery so a gift from France to us. Again, trauma, trauma. So I think, um, and, and Andy was always looking at that. He, he, there's aspects of his work, specifically the civil rights um, images of, of police attacking protesters with dogs. Um, he, he, he photographed that. I mean, you know, and silk screen those. Um, uh, J Jacqueline Onassis Kennedy, you know, the, so he, he was looking not just to the glamorization and the consumer, you know, of, of, of America. He was also looking at the underbelly of America, the realness of America, the trauma, you know, um, and uh, I think even in his celebrity works, you know, and the car crashes, you know, um, he was, he was looking at the realness of Americans. So, you know, that's what um, I think I'm constantly questioning my work about, you know, um, uh, 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 America is a place that chooses to forget its origins a lot of times. And so I, I as an African-American, this is a history. And as American, not just African-American, but as American, this is what I feel is my duty to like m m kind of make people or ask people to um, grapple with and understand and, and go back and think about, commemorate. I think we have not um, particularly grieved or understood what has happened in this country, this short span of 400 years. Um, you know, there's countries on this earth that have been, have long histories in Europe and, and you know, in Africa, you know, I mean, time eons you know and i went to i went to egypt and so you know i saw seven thousand years of history you know and here we're just a little baby you know and and i think we 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 we're not understanding it we're not we're not dealing with it in order to go forward you know and 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 realize that dream that the ants you know that the founding fathers and mothers had for this country, we have to deal with what has happened here. And um, I think that until we do, we won't really realize the dream and utopia of the American experience as the way many of them, them dreamt it to be. Thank you. Um, and Pacifico, you, you uh, mined the collection as well. And you know, Warhol was a, a gay queer man um, a lot of people misunderstood misunderstood that aspect of him, but um, Warhol was a, a social butterfly, but he also made a lot of, um, you know, homoerotic work. And you actually pinpointed some some works in your in your installation. Can you just touch on that for a sec? Yeah. Uh, well, for one, it's just kind of amazing to be in a conversation with Andy Warhol in general, and it's like such a huge, huge honor that I was able to install my work with with some of his paintings. It's like you know, I think a lot about image culture and that's so embedded into my practice. Like, you know, like Chloe was saying, we're inundated with 
photographs and images and we're sold things every day and it's a visual language that we all understand like you don't need an mfa to really read a photograph and i i think that andy really understood that and his usage of appropriation um, has heavily influenced me. I, I've made series. I've made a series of silk screens in the past that were directly inspired by him, and that's actually how you and I started to talk about Fantasy America when we were first picking works out. Um, and so his influence has really kind of looms large over my practice and my relationship to, um, you know, sourcing imagery and, and the sort of um, you know interesting kind of life of a photograph and how it has like you know, the first life of when the picture was originally taken from the original author and then it's appropriated and it could become something completely different in like 20, 30 years time. And that's a lot of what my work's about is like, I read I read the photographs that I appropriate through the lens of history and through so, socio-political uh, change. And, you know, uh, the photographs I'm using are from vintage gay por pornography. And so they're all about fantasy and intimacy, but they're this really kind of intimate, you know, experience between one person, the viewer and the, the material. And here we're reading it through the lens of history. And now it's about innumerable loss and, and longing and uh, a sort of melancholy that is associated with that. And so a lot of the times there's a, you know, the work that I do, it operates on different levels. You know, it's about obviously HIV and AIDS, but it's also about masculinity and it's about performance. And uh, in a lot of these publications, there's uh, these sort of American idealized tropes of what a man is and they're being performed by gay men. And so it's almost like this drag of heteronormative uh, masculinity. And so there's a lot of cowboys. There's a lot of bikers mm -hmm. um which it's so funny like i i kind of just think of bikers as gay i think of cowboys as gay i think about all of these representations of like that are in the village people as like inherently mm -hmm. queer but um i was really drawn to the paintings of cowboys from warhol um i'm always sort of interested in that subversion of like this very like you know, rugged individualism of Ameri of the American dream of like, you know, West the Western frontier and expansion, um, you know, which has like this really complicated, you know, horrible history in our country that we sort of idealize and, you know, perpetuate this fantasy of. And so, you know, mm -hmm. I think he was really good at playing with that. And, you know, Dennis Hopper is an actor and he's performing the role of a cowboy in, in the work and I've juxtaposed it with um, these two really kind of quiet, delicate landscape images of a cowboy hat on a branch um, and a, a pickup truck that are tiny, small little details of these very explicit um, scenarios that are happening on the pages of the magazine. And so I was really thrilled to be able to work that into the installation. If I have any regret, it's that I didn't work with more Warhol paintings and drawings because he has such a rich history of the sort of homoerotic and the sensual. And um, I know that like, you know, through popular culture, he's sort of been like sanitized of the sexuality, but I think it was a really big part of his identity as an artist and the things that he was drawn to. And so much about Warhol um, is about the surface. And I know that like a lot of people think the surface is just this very shallow um, thing that like, you know, doesn't have depth to it. He's talking about like what you see, you know, and I, I, I also deal with the surface. I deal with the surface of the materiality that I work with. I'm blowing up these pages where the print matrix dots become part of the, uh, the overall finished piece. They fall apart and become abstracted in a way. And, you know, it's very much in dialogue with the silkscreen process of the way you know, ink gets pulled through screen and has a sort of similar aesthetic to the way that the image is um, created. So, um, yeah, just really thrilled that uh, yeah. I got to be in that conversation with him. Yeah, and I loved how you picked Dennis Hopper. You know, Dennis Hopper was one of Warhol's, well, he was like Warhol's first Hollywood friend, but he's kind of a queer ally. He was, he, he stars in a Warhol film as dressed like a Tarzan. He um, is one of Warhol's first clients and he even throws Warhol a party in LA, but the fact that he was obviously friends at Warhol, I really love that uh, relationship. Um, for the sake of time, I'm gonna um, move on to Cambodia. I'm gonna ask you this question. Um, you're so civically engaged and I admire you so much for that. And so uh, in the book, America, um, the last passage uh, Warhol says, we all come here from somewhere else and everybody who wants to live in America and obey the law should be able to come too. And there's no such thing as being more or less American, just American. 
And so um, I just wanted to ask you any, had any final thoughts about that. I, I really do think that Warhol, um, you know, he's the son of immigrants. He, I, in my opinion, he, he's the American dream. And um, I just wanted to ask you if you had any thoughts about, you know, maybe the future of America. Oh, man. <laughs> in, a, in a nutshell, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just to Good luck. close it out. <laughs> I think um, it only can exist if the promise is fulfilled. Like it, it poses a, a question. America is a, pro, a 400 year old, 400 plus year old uh, proposition of a democracy in a space that is all inclusive. And in some ways it has fulfilled that, but it can't exist any other way without fulfilling it. And so in a lot of ways, the country has been, a, is, has been fledgling for its entire existence so far. And in order for it to maturate or even really come into fruition, it's gotta be accepting. There's no, there's, there's, you know, there's no halfway pregnant. Like you, it's like, you gotta do it all or else this is not something that has, um, or else it's, you know, just like everything else, you know, it's just another, another state. Um, there's something utopian about that proposed space of uh, um, not only of democracy, but philosophically, it's about total inclusion, about a porous um, melting plot that, that, you know, acknowledges ancestral technologies, that ex- acknowledges the multiplicity of identity, that acknowledge like, this is what it, it has to be or else... Honestly, I think or else it'll fold. Thank you. No, that's great. I think that's a, that's a, that's a great place to end. I wanted to just uh, get one quickie question. Um, the, the exhibition ends uh, August 30th. Um, Nama, um, we're planning to have you perform Stranger. Um, can you just give me a, a little teaser of what you expect, assuming that life opens up and life improves? Um, I know it's very important for you to do performance is live. That's why we're not doing it on Zoom. You often engage with community. Um, you, you also perform with women and, and femmes. So I just wanted to see if you wanted to just give us a little uh, comment about what we should expect. Sure. Um, well, if it happens, you should expect a sweaty performance <laughs> between two women um, that will make you feel uncomfortable, you know, but um, look at things that are happening at that moment, you know, that performance is not, it's choreographed to a certain point, but then it just happens. And there's a lot of violence, but also tenderness in it. Um, and so it's unexpected in a way, even for us, the performers, um, you know, at times we fall and we get up and, you know, there's like some, we fall on someone else, you know. I really hope that um, COVID will allow us to be a bit, um, more loose with our space um, so we can invade other people's space. So they feel, you know, <laughs> some bodies next to them, which I think we're all lacking and missing. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Yeah, I never thought of that. You know, I, I get anxiety just watching a, a TV show. I'm like, they're not wearing masks. They're, they're I know, crowded. I dream about uh, it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but I do, um, but I do, um, I do hope that this happens and I am planning to bring you all to see the exhibition. Um, but I want to thank you all for participating today. I also wanted to thank the Warhol staff and our sponsors who made the whole show happen and believed in it. And um, I want to thank all the viewers at home uh, for watching and, and uh, I hope they can also catch Authors in Conversation with Jessica Lene Moore and uh, Alon Pelayas. So thank you everyone. And I guess we'll be in touch thank and you. hopefully see each other in person thank soon. You. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you everybody. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye, take care.